Hi, my name is Peter. I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about Prime Acoustic. Uh, and I've got Jay Porter with me uh, to continue on our saga. And Jay is, of course, our product specialist. He helps uh, train all of our customers, designs rooms. He's been pivotal for radial and Prime Acoustic uh, product. So, Thought it'd be great to have Jay come in and answer some questions or talk a bit about what we're doing here today. Um, earlier, we discussed the different type of, types of acoustic products that are out there. And uh, as you know, a lot of people use foam on their walls. And we, of course, uh, still sell a little bit of foam, but pretty much have migrated away from foam. Maybe, Jay, you can talk a bit about that and why people have done that. Sure. Uh, one reason we've moved away from foam is that density of foam just really isn't that high. It really only a good uh, high frequency absorber. So what people tend to do is end up putting too much of it in their room and attenuates all the highs and sucks all the lows or it doesn't do anything for the lows. Lows continue bouncing around. You end up with a room that sounds like this. All the highs are gone. Um, so that's one big reason the performance of this high density fiberglass is just so much better than foam because it is much, much higher density. The second reason is fire code. Uh, foam cannot be installed into commercial facilities anymore. Uh, most places it's illegal. Fire marshals will come in or insurance companies will come in and say, no, this isn't safe to hang on the wall. Whereas the uh, uh, high density glass wool gets uh, hung up. It's all class one or class A fire rated and can be installed safely anywhere. So those are the two biggest reasons why we move away into this pro level product. Yeah, and in fact, what people don't realize is professionals have been using glass wool for years. It's only now that it's become more affordable that the average person uh, can, can use it. This is a, uh, one of our many uh, Broadway panels. What I want to show you is, of course, this is um, what they call a micro mesh. So it completely encapsulates the fiberglass uh, strands inside, and then the edges are all resin hearted. The reason that it's done this way is that it doesn't allow any of the um, glass wool to escape. Uh, we like that. We don't want to be breathing glass wool. I don't think anybody does. So by having it fully encapsulated, you don't have a problem. The next thing is, this is the impaler. This is our, our standard hang-on and hanger impaler. So you just, you know, two screws into the wall. And then I'll hold this and I'll show, uh, I'll get to Jay to show how this works. So basically you have a panel and you just send it, go like that. Boom. It hangs. That's it. It's that easy. And when you're ready to take it off, move your panels to another room, you take it off and away you go. Um, that just makes installation so much easier. Um, Jay, you've done a bunch of studios, uh, both back in the day with foam and, mm -hmm. and with this stuff. What's your thought on that? Oh, it's definitely, I mean, a couple screws to hang this in the wall. The science doesn't even have to be that, you don't have to be that accurate. You can just slap a couple of these up on there, put a level on top of your panel and stick it down on. The, the old uh, hanging foam was really messy. You had to make sure and commit to where you're putting it the very first shot. Put a whole bunch of glue up. You're going to mess up your drywall underneath. Uh, try to line up that panel. You really only had a minute or two to really adjust it and get it uh, get it perfectly straight. And once it was up there, get the scraper out because that's the only way it's coming off, along with a good chunk of your drywall as well. Yeah, right. And of course, the cleanup is expensive. This is a new one. This is uh, actually uh, one of our our push on impalers, and and this impaler is designed for. Uh, taking the panel and pushing it straight on like this. And in this case, if you, uh, because it's not kind of like a hang situation, it's more of a push on situation, we also leave a spot here for just a dab of glue. So that way, when you do push it on, it'll just hold it in place. And again, it doesn't fe deface your wall. That's the whole idea is to make it so that you can remove the panel, use it someplace else. Uh, we supplied uh, NBC for the Olympics uh, with all of their panels for their uh, remote broadcast uh, station. And of course, after the Olympics, where in the past they'd throw all of that stuff away, they just kept it and they're moving it to England right now because they're going to be doing the Olympics in England. So there's the benefit. Um, there are also other impalers like this one here. This is a corner impaler and we have an offset impaler. Maybe Jay can talk about those. Sure. So the corner impaler allows you to mount a standard, say, 2x4 Broadway panel on a 45 degree across the corner. And what that does is create a base trap. It creates a little cavity in, uh, in the corner with the airspace behind actually far more effective than the old foam wedges used to see people into the corner. So even though people think that this solid foam chunk into the corner is going to be a better base trap, it's actually more effective to have a panel and airspace than it is to have that solid piece of foam. That's probably got to do mostly with the density. And again, if you think about foam, most foam is about one pound 
per cubic foot, where the high density uh, glass wool we use is six pounds. So you get much higher density, much lower base uh, absorption. I'm going to just jump over on the base absorption and move this thing into the picture. You can see this. This here is a big max trap. And what the max trap does is it uses a three inch a Broadway panel on the front. So you still get all your high frequency and mid frequency and even low frequency absorption down to about 100 hertz, I would say is fairly effective. And then on the inside, we add this diaphragm. And this is a di diaphragmatic resonator. And what this does is this vibrates um, depending on the loudest frequency in the room. Now, it'll only vibrate with bass. So what it does, it sucks out all that deep, deep bass. Uh, this is a fabulous, fabulous piece. Uh, it hangs in any corner, what they call French cleats. So you just a couple screws into the wall for your bass. This just hangs up and away you're done. Most studios put two of these in and boy, uh, Jay, You've put a lot in different rooms. Uh, maybe you can talk a bit about your experience and what your clients have had to say. Um, well, yeah, it's one of the, uh, probably the best things about this. And I, I often tell people is that it's uh, a bass trap for dummies or a self-tuning bass trap. You often hear of guys putting all this time and effort into the mathematics and figuring out exactly what the most problematic frequency is in their room. Oh, yeah, I've done all these calculations and you know, my length and times width and all these different things and find out my room has a really big problem at 80 hertz or my, my room has a really big problem at 100 hertz. What do I do? And then they go out and get a bass trap tuned to that frequency or, or specifically built for 80 hertz. And that's all it does is suck 80 hertz out of the room all day long. This thing, you really don't have to think about it. You just have to go, okay, I know I've got low frequency problems throw it in there, throw it up on the wall, and it's going to tune itself to those those uh, problematic frequencies that you're having. So you don't have to necessarily worry about the 80 versus 100 or whatever. You can just throw this in there and it'll work. And not only that, but because it's a uh, fiberglass front, it's really a broadband trap. It's not just a bass trap. So therefore, your money's not just going into something that's only sucking 80 hertz out. This thing's working across the board. It's working at those really low frequencies where you're going to have problems, and it's going to count towards your overall absorption. Uh, you'll find that when you place a bass trap in your room, the most efficient place for it to be is in the corners. Uh, we make a number of products designed for that. So again, look at your room, look at the layout of your room. Uh, bass traps often, well, they can go anywhere because bass goes anywhere. It's omnidirectional. But uh, as Jay mentioned, because the front panel is also absorptive, you can use it as part of your high frequency treatment for your near field reflection. So you can either go in the front or back. Most guys tend to put them behind them, but it, there's, there are no hard rules of thumb. Uh, beneficial to put in the corners, though, that's where uh, base and energy tends to uh, congregate or migrate. So therefore, it's more efficient. That's probably a great place to go. Why don't we talk about a few other things? Let's maybe just briefly talk about diffusers, and I'll pass you this thing over here, Jay. Sure. So this is the radiator, and uh, what this is, is is an open back diffuser, so it allows it to work in a, many different places. Um, there are some people out there who argue that something like this isn't a true diffuser because each well doesn't have a depth. Uh, it's, it's just open back, so if you hang it flat on a wall, the wall is all going to be at that, that same depth. The thing is, is because all sound almost always hits at it at an angle, the sound's actually going to break out and scatter quite well. You don't have sound going straight in, hitting the wall, and bouncing straight out. In the real world, that just doesn't happen. Sound's going to be hitting at an angle. Because there's so many of these wells, it actually does break up and scatter the sound quite well. Um, perhaps uh, more commonly, the where these are used is above the mix position. So these can be suspended in a cloud above the desk and prevents anything from any sound from directly hitting the ceiling and coming back at you as a powerful primary reflection. As opposed to using an absorption cloud above the uh, mix position, you put in something like this, keeps the room sounding bigger, a little more lively, but you don't have any of those real strong reflections coming back and competing with what's coming out of your speakers. So it's just a matter of personal taste. Um, drops into the ceiling tiles, same thing puts it as a cloud above your mix position, you have a drop in ceiling, you can pop out a couple tiles, opens up that plenum and makes it seem like it's part of your room, makes the room sound bigger, but not echoey. Uh, and perhaps the best use I've heard of these recently, uh, when we've started uh, specifying them into a number of rooms in this way is in front of glass. You've got a room where 
can't do anything about those reflections coming off the glass, but you want to keep natural light coming in. You don't want to cover it up. You don't want heavy drapes in front of it all the time. Some of these hung in front of the glass can actually stop any really uh, big problematic reflections from coming off that window. So it can yeah, I just want to touch on Dan's base on this because, you know, obviously the de design of this is fairly, fairly simple. It is not a quadratic diffuser like the big expensive razor blade. So the benefit is uh, really scattering energy. Um, the way these devices work, they typically work as a factor of depth, just like the acoustic panel. So the deeper the scattering device or the diffuser, the lower the frequency, the narrower the uh, slots are, the higher the frequency they, they perform in. For the most part, we're really trying to attack the mid-range when we use these types of products. We're trying to control those mids because we communicate in the mids. Everything's in the mids. Guitar is in the mids. Remember that. It's all in the mids. So you really want to think in terms of controlling mid-range uh, um, when you're looking at scattering. You can't scatter bass frequencies. Anything below 300, 400 hertz will not get scattered anyway. It's just the energy is too deep. It's too big. The wavelength is too large. You can't do anything about scattering low frequencies. It's, it's way too difficult. So that's what's beneficial about these types of products is that they're functional, they're reasonably affordable, and you can use them all over your studio. So they're a nice add-on to absorption. So most recording studios, will you will use a balance between absorption and diffusion or sound scattering and then add in some bigger bass traps if, if the budgets allow. That's a great point there, actually. It um, would be good for you guys to touch on the difference between absorption and diffusion because I think that's something maybe is commonplace to you guys, but uh, the people that will be watching this could, could use a bit of a, an intro. Sure. Uh, well, absorption and diffusion, basically, they serve a similar function. What we're trying to do is re, re, you know, eliminate those primary reflections and, and eliminate uh, room resonance and scatter echo and all these things. So we can either absorb the energy by converting that sound energy into heat. That's what absorption is. We're actually causing the minute glass fibers inside the uh, the Broadway panel to vibrate and it's, a, it's what they call a uh, thermodynamic transfer. Uh, with diffusion, however, what you're doing is you're just scattering the energy. In other words, you're, you're causing it to echo back into the room, but not echo as a single plane, but you're having it scatter and break up the energy. So the difference is, is there. The idea behind having uh, the diffuser inside the room is, of course, to keep more air in the room a sense of space, um, just a more comfortable working environment. Jay, what do you think? Any? Yeah, um, the, the problem with acoustics is a little bit subjective. Everyone has a bit of different taste on what they want in the room. Some people like a room to be really dead. Other people like a room to be fairly live. Now, when you're in a studio and you're trying to build a control room to make a, you know, a good natural sounding environment, you don't want too much absorption. Too much absorption makes a room too dead. It's like mixing on headphones. Anyone, that, anyone that's ever tried to mix a record with headphones kind of understands what ends up happening is you make this CD, it sounds great in your headphones, you bring it out to the car and everything's got too much reverb on. You didn't hear the room. So you ended up adding all this reverb onto it to make it sound natural to your ears. The same thing happens when a room has too much absorption. So what you do is get a nice balance of absorption and then bring in some diffusion to kind of uh, counteract that so it's you still don't get any of these direct problematic reflections coming back in, but a room starts to sound a lot more uh, a full size you get too much absorption in a room and they say it's it's nearly anechoic it's like an anechoic chamber where it's you have no sense of how big the room is and sense of space so you end up just putting too much effects on everything to make it sound that yeah, the mix starts to go bad. Uh, you know, I mentioned this uh, previously. Really, you get used to your, your room. Think of these as tools. You start with basic absorption. You might look at adding, you know, some diffusion or bass traps as you go along. The more you listen to your room, the better you become familiar with the room, the better your mixes will become. It's a normal progression. It starts even a small kit. We have something called London, what's the London 8? I think it's two hundred dollars. It's a great beginning if you have no budget. It's one hundred ninety nine bucks. See, that sounds better. It's cheaper than two hundred dollars. One hundred ninety nine dollars. It's a great beginning, and that's what you really want to do. Just get her started. Get it going, and then after that, add to your room. Uh, you will not believe. Uh, and one of the big mistakes people do is they say, "Boy, my mix doesn't sound very good." So I'm going to go out and spend more money on a microphone or a preamp and whatever else. And we sell a lot of this gear too. You know, don't forget radio. We sell preamplifiers and everything else. Trust me, trust Jay, uh, 
fix your room. You need to fix your room. You cannot tell the difference between a good preamp and a great preamp unless you have the acoustics right in your room. So at least get some treatment going on in your room. It'll make it's more than anything else. It's probably the best thing you can do to fixing any room. Uh, and, and that brings to mind another product. We talk about this. All right, we have the recoil stabilizer. This is something, <laughs> this is a heavy thing. This don't, this is not foam, okay? This is not foam. This is, I just want to talk about this product because all the top engineers from Capitol Records, from Metalworks in Toronto to you name it, all these studios around the world, all the top producers, they're all starting to use recoils. And this is probably something else that you can do put in your studio that will make a huge difference. Um, what you'll find is that when you take a loudspeaker and you put it on a desk, that desk will start to vibrate. And what the recoil stabilizer does is it creates a cushion in between that vibration, yet stabilizes the loudspeaker. Okay. Yeah, the big thing with the recoil is a lot of people do put their monitors straight on a piece of foam, and that's what a lot of people think this thing is. And again, Pete was feeling and show, trying to show the weight of this thing. It's great because you want to isolate your monitor and decouple it from your desk, your speaker stands, what have you. The problem is when you do put a monitor on a piece of foam, the foam's so lightweight, it's not properly supporting the monitor. The monitor's actually now recoiling like a rifle. Great because you decoupled it, but uh, not so great because now it's wobbling around. It's, uh, you know, ever so subtle movements, but as anyone knows, talking about phase and that sort of thing, even a subtle movement of your monitor is really going to uh, be detrimental to the sound. So when you bring that mass back under the monitor, get that monitor anchored and stable again, but then have the foam to decouple it, it's sort of the best of both worlds. And uh, really uh, let that monitor perform and fire everything it has at you uh, so you're not hearing any sort of smearing or anything else. Big, big differences you notice, a lot more bottom end. Uh, you know, some people comment that almost an extra octave of bottom end because now nothing's being sucked up by a piece of foam under the monitor. And then your stereo image gets twice as large. Uh, it's really evident in a room that already has some acoustics. Uh, you bring this in there, especially someone's already maybe using a, a heavyweight monitor stand, uh, you know, a really solid meter bridge that doesn't have much resonance to it. You might not notice that extra bottom end, but you do know your, notice your stereo image gets from having that monitor properly anchored as well as decoupled. So the recoil stabilizer, very popular product. Um, we <clears throat> literally sold thousands and thousands and thousands of these in the marketplace. Stabilizes the loudspeaker. There's a mass component, very, very heavy piece of uh, steel here. It's laser cut steel. They're expensive. They're not cheap because they really hard to build to make look nice. Um, uh, other than that, isolation. Try it. You will again, it's one of those things that you have no idea how good it is until you try it. And just go onto the website, take a look at the various uh, comments from people. And uh, they're using them because it really helps. Again, why do we bring this up? You've got your recording studio. It's your room. Before you start to do a bunch of stuff, make sure you take care of the basics. Fix your acoustics. Make sure your loudspeakers are performing the way they're designed to perform. They start resonating all over. They're flopping around all over the place. They're not going to sound right. Because when they were tested, they were tested on a block of, you know, maybe this thick of granite or something. Uh, that's how the loudspeaker manufacturers test their loudspeaker. You put them on foam, everything changes. Uh, you'll find this to be a huge addition to your studio.